This first debate, we're going to focus on the energy transition. And we're going to be aided by these fine people. So I hope that with your good offices, we can dig into the wide-ranging implications of road transport's energy transition for all the main players, for the EU, for uh, the auto industry, for the grid operators, for the battery producers, for the environment and society as a whole. And of course, we are going to look at some of the policy asks to oil the wheels of this transition. So, I'm not going to do long intros, but here directly on my left, who I hope I don't feel too close for comfort, is Carlo Goan, who is the VP of Research and Innovation at the PSA Group. And you're very much into R&D because you used to coordinate the R&D department. And do you have, sorry, have I written this? Am I correct? You have an MA in Applied Mechanics. I love this because that's as far from me as it could possibly be. So, you will be the first lady I will turn to. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Artur Runga Metzger. He is director at DG Climate Action at the European Commission. So it makes sense. He's responsible for international and EU climate strategy, uh, road assessments, transport, carbon capture, and of course was um, instrumental. You, you really plugged into the Paris Agreement. You were all over that like a cheap suit, as we say in English, which is a good thing. A good thing. Okay. On, on the left, we have Max Warburton. I think, do a lot of you know Max? I was told he's well known. Ooh. In your own bedroom or living room. Max. Max is the vice president of Sanford Bernstein. Now, can you just say, I've got it's a research and brokerage firm, but does that sound way too... But the, the most important thing is where this guy is special is he can talk about some key trends because this is his business. He's an auto analyst and he's very, very good at it. So no pressure for you there. On the left, we have Egbert Locks, who is Senior Vice President, Government Affairs at Umicor. Are we all familiar with Umicor? Yes, very, very good. Um, and you're a chemical engineer, and you were also you, a lot of experience, like this lovely lady in R&D, as I understand it, because you ran a, a corporate R&D team. And finally, last but not least, Julia. Julia Poliskanova, who is Director of Clean Vehicles and E-Mobility at Transport and the Environment. Are we all familiar with Transport and the Environment? Yes, very, very good. She is steeped in knowledge around CO2 emissions, air quality, sustainability. You've got a degree in energy engineering. I like that. That makes me feel I'm, in, I'm well supported here. So I'm going to do a very simple thing. I, I told everybody that I terrorised you all into being concise, so forgive me for that. But I am going to give an opening question that's the same for all of you um, to hear, you know, so that we can see where you sit. What is the key challenge in the drive to zero emission mobility? There are many, but where would you put the main focus. Thank you. Can we start with you, Carla? So I'll start and I'll be uh, very, very short. <laughs> the key challenge for me is that um, today we have aligned, I would say, planets towards this uh, energy transition. However, today the main challenge is really to be sure and to have the consistency in the pace and the magnitude of all the roadmaps all the ecosystem stakeholders have now to apply. And um, I will just, of course, you are, all, you are all aware that the fact that all the OEMs are just launching blitz, electrified product blitz. We are just opening this area. And just to give you some figures for PSA Group, it means that by 2021, we will launch no less than 23 electrified models. That is to say, full electric, whether also uh, plug-in hybrid ones. So we are just at the tipping point where the products are coming, and however, they could be even the best in terms of autonomy, in terms of recharging time, in terms of uh, life cycle also, if we don't have the other assets of the whole ecosystem, we will face a great deal towards our customers. So I think the key challenge for all of us, because we are all part of this ecosystem, is now we must align our pace and magnitude at the same pace to be almost ensure that we will fulfill all those, pr th those pr promises. And uh, I'm talking about, of course, uh, charging infrastructure. I'm talking, of course, about uh, public, um, public s finance also and uh, ability of uh, sustain and help the introductions of those new objects. I'm talking about society explaining also how those new products are probably answering the 
anxiety still uh, issues we have to deal with um, because anxiety is linked probably from a part on the technology but also linked to the fact that we are not sure to find the infrastructure required to recharge our cars. So we all have these roadmaps. I think we have all decided it. Um, the EU has also decided them. Now we must absolutely be fully and at the same pace and at the same magnitude to really overcome the challenges we have just in front of us. Okay, thank you. And, um, you know, if I was, I mean, okay, this is possibly a bit simplistic, but coming back to you, you've said that, you know, we're at this tipping point, so uh, we really, we need to have it there, otherwise the whole thing just doesn't lock together. We heard it from you, didn't we, Mervi, when you said, well, it's we're encouraging people, but then encouraging them into what? And you're saying the same thing. So if you could wave your magic wand, what's the one concrete thing you want to, to achieve that? What's missing for you? Um, for me, what is still, what uh, from an OEM perspective, I think that from the uh, charging infrastructure, we are still laying behind. We don't have, I would say, the, um, the same, the pace we have to implement in our products is not really at the same level as the roadmaps we see okay. all over, I would say, the European um, states. Uh, and they are not aligned and consistent with what we have to implement and apply. Okay. So really a focus on charging infrastructure. Okay. Thank and you. not only in cities, but also, I would say, think about ah, no, suburban uh, also items, because electromobility is not only a topic for cities. Absolutely. Yes, it is, of course, one major issue, but not only. Well, personally, as a non-specialist, I think the place where it has the most credibility or as much credibility is precisely in of those areas that you also, Mervi, spoke about. It's not just about the cities. That's the big, uh, that's the big sell, isn't it? Increased mobility for those who are in those areas that are already quite disconnected. So that's a good intro for you, Artur, because you've seen there, you know, uh, member states aren't aligned, we're behind in the charging infrastructure, and we have this word, these words pace and magnitude. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the main challenge? I think we are spot on already. Uh, I think I would even go one step further. I would say uh, within the next three years, if we would have one million charging points in Europe rolled out, then I think the car industry is in the right place to come up with all these super models that are so attractive to the consumers. So I think that is what we really need. That is the one ask I would have at the present point in time. But of course, the whole jigsaw is a mo bit more complicated if you look wider. So we also need to lay the foundation for uh, low emission or no emission mobility in other sectors. And I think Eric put it very nicely. He said, often we talk about cars. Cars is easy. I think we know the solution. But the trucks is something where we need to have also lay the foundation for what can happen in the coming years. Uh, and that probably is a much more diverse solution that is required. Uh, different also for different parts of Europe. You have some areas where biofuels might come in very strongly because there is the resources in order to do that. Still, it's not moving forward. So we need to lay the foundation here with research, with demonstration in the coming years to make sure that we have the low emission mobility also there. So I think that these are the things we need to focus on. The third point is something, uh, and that was also in the wish list of ASEA, is how do you make sure that you keep industry in Europe? And here it is really about value chains. And I think the graph was so nice from McKinsey to see, okay, there's a small value chain that we have from the past, and there's a big one that mm -hmm. is out mm -hmm. there. And we need to make sure we capture all the different elements of the value chain. And where we are not that good at is, at the moment, the batteries. I think everybody knows that. That's the reason we have come up with the battery lines. And that is something where we will have to become stronger, where also public investment will have to come in to make sure it's going to happen. The signs are very positive. I think what we have seen over the last months in terms of commitment to investment into new cell manufacturing in Europe, I think that is good news but it still needs to go faster. Mm -hmm. Okay, and since you are the gentleman from the commission here with us, I would like to ask just, you know, you said, you know, MS member states are not aligned. What, you know, what would you say in response to that? You want me to criticize member states? No, you're never allowed to do that. <laughs> Trust me. I ran campaigns for the commission for 10 years and we were never allowed to name, shame, do... Say. We always wanted to say the Danes were brilliant at everything and we never could. 
So, no, I do not want you to. I would just like to get you to do a nice no, I think when it comes answer. to alignment, of course, one of the big tasks for the Commission is what is called the MFF, so the next multi-annual financial oh. framework. Um, and I'm not going to blame member states, but give us the money that we can do the one million charging points, please. <laughs> because they fall into the ground of your countries. Okay. Thank you very much. So, over to you, Max. Yeah, I mean, you, you've asked me to talk about the key challenge. Uh, there are so many of them, and the first two panellists have, have covered a lot of them, but guess what? As a financial analyst uh, who covers the, the OEMs, for me um, and my uh, client base, that the biggest issue is how the hell do the OEMs afford to do this? If you look at um, how the burden is being spread, uh, yes, there's a role for governments to play in terms of uh, infrastructure, there's a role probably for Europe to think about battery cell production, um, but at the moment, a lot of the burden falls on the OEMs. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm genuinely an objective observer. I'm not paid by car companies, just to be clear. I'm paid by investors. My job is to connect investors uh, with automakers, to help automakers find financing. Uh, the people I deal with can invest in any industry they want. They can go and do something much easier, like invest in people making uh, shampoo or aftershave. They don't need to be an automotive. And that's what we're beginning to see now. We're seeing capital flee the European auto industry. Most professional investors see the industry uh, as almost uninvestable. Um, and that is going to be a problem, particularly if we have to manage this transition during an economic cycle. If we have um, tougher times than the ones the industry's faced in recent years, Bear in mind just how much money the European industry has been making in China. That has been papering over a lot of cracks for a lot of companies, particularly the Germans. But if times get tougher, I think we need to think carefully about what the financial implications are uh, of this transition, particularly uh, beyond 2021. Um, I said I was objective, uh, impartial. Um, let's, let's be open. For a long time, the European auto industry dragged its heels on this. They didn't want to build electric cars. They would come up with all sorts of excuses as to why electric wasn't going to work. From my perspective, that has changed 180 degrees. It's non-negotiable now, pretty much, isn't it? The rules are locked down. 2030 looks almost carved in stone. So the industry has to do this, and we have put the industry's many brilliant minds to work, thinking about how can we get costs down. So the industry is trying really, really hard. Um, Battery costs are not falling fast enough for these cars to be economic for most consumers. That is the reality. I've spent an immense amount of time in the last few years trying to understand where we are in this. I was based in Asia for four years, looked closely at what the Chinese were doing in batteries. With current chemistry, it's really, really hard to make a cost equation here. So the key challenge is how do we help the industry find a way to finance this transition? Thank you. Anybody want to come? Coming on that? Yet? No? Yes, please. I was looking clearly at you, sir, so please. <clears throat> I think I would, I would agree with that view. And I think that's something, uh, at least from the EU side, with our higher. limited budget, um, we have been starting to do, for instance, helping um, yeah, cell production in Europe with um, the help of the European Investment Bank. And I think that that role is probably going to increase in um, the near future, I think, definitely. Um, still, my main worry at the moment is to make sure that the business plans of the OEMs are going to work out, and that depends on the cars being bought from the showrooms. Can I come to you, please, sir? Egbert. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, my view on the key challenge towards uh, the zero emission mobility is that it has to be a holistic transition well equilibrated, well coordinated, should be a move towards electrified, uh, not only pure electrical, but electrified. And I like to add also connected mobility. I think the vision of just replacing a thermal powertrain by electrified powertrain is not what will bring us to the zero emission mobility. We think it should be based upon the circular economy principles. It's a unique chance when you develop a new uh, technology to make its recyclability uh, right in to the design, and that is what we will need, seeing the material use, the, the need for material use. Mm. But 
along all those wishes uh, from holistic and well coordinated and well equilibrated, the speed of transition must be realistic. Nothing, in my view, as an engineer, can be worse when you have this unique opportunity of a momentum of a society wanting change, and then you blow it by having raised expectations that you cannot deliver. That is a missed opportunity that you will suffer for the next 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So um, avoiding frustration, in my view, is key to the success of this unique opportunity. Don't compromise on the target, but stay very realistic on the way towards it. Okay, and you said, so you said there, you know, this is a unique opportunity, and, and you've seen, I've asked this question many times, that there's a, there's a need, that there is, you know, for this transformation, for this transition. Um, do you witness that? I mean, I know, let's leave in climate change aside, I mean, we, we see that. That is absolutely, keep going in and out, hello again. That's, that's absolutely clear. There is a lot of conversation in the public domain. But this particular societal transformation low carbon thank you do we see do we see an engagement there from the public an understanding there i asked the question in finland how does it feel yeah well i i can uh, i i have not done a, a deep statistical analysis I my personal experience i'm an engineer i'm a uh, uh, developer um, i worked many years ago to develop together with Peugeot the, the uh, uh, particulate filter for diesel engines. I've seen change, I like change, but then I always check. I live in Brussels during the week. Uh, we have uh, a big square in front of my home that has been completely redone. Guess what? Not a single loading point. My colleagues, uh, some of them are also present, look like me also at, at some real estate, new real estate projects in Brussels, and just out of curiosity, checked, there is no infrastructure foreseen in the biggest three projects that are being built in Brussels or that have been delivered already in Brussels for having the recharging of electric cars. And that is my, it's, it's a reality. And we can't force it. So I'm, I'm, I'm also very, very liberal thinking. I don't believe in enforcement, but I, I believe in repeating and choosing and, 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 and helping. Yeah. It, it can only come from the people that ultimately buy the thing, huh? okay. buy the home with a, a charging point, buy the electric car. Okay. And that needs, apparently, its time. And that's reality. Thank you. So you sort of have, I suppose, the privileged guest to come last because you hear what everybody else said. It'd be interesting to hear what, reson what resonates for you. There was a big talk there of, you know, really keeping industry in Europe and the importance of the value chain, these costs, this is crazy, they're not coming down fast enough. Where can the EU help with its funding instruments? Where were we at? Um, very important talking about the sort of the ecosystem as, as a whole in terms of the circular economy. Um, where is the demand? And then this matching between, you know, the, I was about to say products, but it's more than products, isn't it? Mobility services and those act, the infrastructure where there seems to be a big frustration. Um, what's your, where are your challenges? Well, I think first to say is I really feel like we in Brussels live in a new world. We have a new parliament, new commission, new commission president. Climate ambition is all on the agenda, which is great. It's it's great opportunity. CO2 standards coming in next year. We see hundreds of electric vehicle models being developed and coming online. And we recently analyzed some of the production data in Europe, and it actually looks more promising than we thought. Millions and millions of vehicles produced in Europe electric vehicles are coming to be replacing the conventional cars. Interesting fact, by 2025, the largest country per capita to produce EVs will be, anyone wants to take a guess? Slovakia which today is the largest uh, diesel and petrol car producer per capita as well. So it's, the change is coming. And I would say the key challenge is to keep the momentum, enforce, uh, deploy, uh, implement, to, to really just keep it going. It's going in the right direction. We are at the tipping point, but the only way is, is the way forward. Um, and a, a quick comment here on, on some of the things we hear from potentially the, the new commission. Uh, 
more ambition, greater carbon pricing, it's all great. Uh, a bit puzzled by some of them. Uh, don't find it helpful maybe to reopen the discussion on road transport in the emission trading scheme. Now, I'm not going to give anyone an econometric lecture here on emissions trading scheme. It's, it's, it's not the place, there'll be many opportunities. But instead of spending time on that, I think there's so many challenges new commission can do to help the industry and help the demand for those vehicles for the investments of the industry in the coming years. First of all, we really need to improve across the member states taxation to really help people wanting to buy that car with a purchase price. A lot can be done. There's already a lot of fleets and segments, taxes, private hire vehicles, corporate fleets, where immobility already makes total sense. There are just some barriers to be overcome. So let's start there rather than, you know, with those people that, let's be honest, can never, uh, even in the past, were able to afford a new car. Secondly, infrastructure. Can't really stress it more importantly. Ne really, it's, it's not just about the numbers. It's really about where those charge points are. Mm -hmm. What are they? Really with the consumer in mind, the consumer experience, where will people want to charge? Commercial property developers really stand out here. There's a really, and, and you just mentioned it as well, a really, really untapped potential. Gym places, sport clubs, uh, supermarkets, hotels, all of these places, if they had in a city charging infrastructure, and I think there's more there we can do than, than just uh, talk about it. Uh, I, I really think this would solve some of the residential issues because there's just not enough space in the city for, for everyone in a flat to, to have a charge point. I think that's really important. Um, battery value chain and, and this industrial story is also really, really key. Uh, industry now in Europe have invested 150 billion into immobility to date. So success in this area is now the industrial success really here in Europe in the future. But we need to do much more to really secure Europe as the key sustainable battery production, circular battery production champion. Uh, and I think that by 2023, with so many factories being announced, that story about prices not, go, not going down fast enough will be solved. With all of this scale, it will be happening. Just 16 gigafactories already announced or planned to be in Europe alone. So that's, that's all good news. But last okay. but not least, oh, okay. one last. I okay. hear you. Go I see it. you. Go for it. Um, I think we also need to be honest. Uh, e-mobility, electric cars, is not the silver bullet. It's part of the solution. And there's much more we need to do in, in cities, in a wider mobility, in the way we use space in a city beyond just replacing every car with, with an EV. And, and that's true. Mm -hmm. and, and it was great to see the presentation to that effect. Thank you. I think, I mean, just to come back on that issue, two issues there before I open it to the floor, and this issue of technology neutrality, that again was something that we heard from the Finns, you said that was very, very important, um, and there's no silver bullet. But just let me touch on one thing, this issue, you said there, well, you know, we need to help people, there's tax incentives, how can we do it? Anything else? Because you said, you know, until I see that demand, until I see them being driven off forecourts, I'm, you know, so what other, what else? Because is there not, people are not entirely sure around electric vehicles, are they really that clean? Because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of conversation around this. They're not affordable yet. So we've looked a lot at the infrastructure, we've touched on affordability, but what about people really understanding whether it's, whether it's a go or whether it's worthwhile? Anybody? Yes, yeah? go, go ahead, Carla. Yeah. I'll try to start and, and then I'll pass the mic. Um, Yes, you're right, and I think that uh, that's also something that has been already highly discussed, is that um, talking only of uh, these environmental solution of electromobility, looking at the tank-to-wheel solution, is not considering the overall impact of those solutions. So we absolutely need also to improve the way we acknowledge, evaluate the different portfolio of solutions having this, I would say, whole life cycle analysis. It's not only talking about batteries, it's talking about the raw materials, it's talking about, of course, manufacturing, it's talking about the recycling, it's talking about the second life of those batteries. Mm -hmm. And the same issues, the same questions are also asked for another kind of technology. We talked about fuel cell, uh, of course, technologies. It's the same thing, looking at the way you produce the H2, may lead to a quite different overall synthesis. Mm -hmm. So yes, you're right. 
And I think that on this perspective, and I think that what has been done through the EBA, uh, that is to say the European Battery Initiative, looking at the way we want to labelize an eco-design linked to the way we pr want to produce these batteries is a first step on this way. But yes, neutral, te neutral technologies, and of course having this whole vision on the life cycle analysis to be sure mm -hmm. we are proposing the best solution but looking at the overall cycle and not only to the, I would say, uh, um, product Absolutely. solutions. But then that is also up to the consumer being informed enough to understand what that whole life cycle is all about and making choices, yes. Yeah, I mean, Carla, Carla raises all sorts of interesting points and, you know, being in a research and uh, development function, she's got to think on very long cycle. We've got to get this done in the next 18 months. You know, these cars are turning up in 2020. Can everyone hear me on this microphone? On tw in 2020, 2021, and we've got, to, we've got to sell them. And when I talk to all sorts of people throughout the auto companies and, and, and related, uh, related industry players, there's just not convincing uh, market research to suggest that we're going to be able to sell these cars. You talk about a tipping point, we're close to a tipping point. We want to get this going. I think we're actually heading probably towards EV oversupply and some quite ugly pricing in 2021. Um, the only company that really, let's be honest, is going all in on electric, I mean, all in maybe is an exaggeration, but the one that's most enthusiastic is, is Volkswagen. And Volkswagen's following almost the, the Steve Jobs approach of market research is pointless, consumers don't know what they want till you, you show it to them. And, and let's hope that's the case with the, the ID products. But pretty much every other company looks at what Volkswagen's doing and doesn't understand what they think they're seeing in the market because others don't see it. Yes. I would say that um, there is a lot of potential and a lot of consumers, if you talk to them, if there was the right car for them, would buy that. But beyond that, speaking of market service, I think as any industry, the car industry has an incredible power to sell the product that they want to. There's a lot of economics theory that says, you know, people don't actually know what they want. It's kind of, they, it, 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 you know, they think that's what they want, but actually it's the society around. It's the way things have been marketed and shown to them. I don't believe that anyone is born wanting an SUV, but look how many SUVs are being sold. It, it is just, why are they growing so much? It's not some generic burn, you know, wish of, of consumers. So there's a huge, huge sales and marketing power of, of our car industry, and I really believe they, they will use it. I also add that we can do much, much more with dealerships. A lot of people today that try to buy an electric car are not given the right information yeah, sure. simply because dealerships today lack clear understanding. For example, in the UK, as part of their zero uh, strategy, special certification and training programs for dealerships were, were done, mm -hmm. and I think that's very, very helpful because that's the contact between the person who wants to buy by car and, and, and the car manufacturer, first That's of all. absolutely critical. Okay, I'm going to just park it for a second there, if I may, ladies and gentlemen, because we have 20 minutes only, and I want to give you the opportunity for last words. So I'm just going to throw things open to the floor. I'm half blinded and half you're in the penombre. So um, there is a gentleman there. That's so cute. It's me. You rose out of your seat. Anybody else? Let's just see. Perhaps do we take two or three. So those three. So we'll park it for the minute. Doesn't matter which order. Keep it lovely and concise, please. Are you going to throw a catch box somewhere? You're terrified. There's two people at the back. You might... Ha oh, gosh. That was just so bad. No, okay, that's not fair. Um, please stand. We can't see you at all. You're in blasting lights. Oh, Say hello, person in the shadows. Who are you, and what's your question? Speak yeah, speak right in the box. That's okay. Yes. Oh, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. So I'm uh, Claude Chanson from Recharge, the Advanced Rechargeable Batteries Association in Brussels, and I wanted to uh, have the the feedback from the panel about this question about taxation and uh, the real cost of the carbon, because it seems that, or, I mean, it is said that uh, probably we have not yet paid uh, the real cost of using, uh, uh, let's say, carbon-producing uh, fuels. And we see, of course, the consequences on the environment. And so there is uh, the global approach about saying we should, in fact, have a real price for uh, whatever we are using in, uh, as a technology, and that could include a better assessed value for the carbon and the carbon impact. Okay. Of course, on the global okay. warming. Okay, you need to, okay. And then that would be the question. Uh, 
could that be a fair base to think about taxation of the, uh, let's say, a neutral approach on the technology base, but would um, a taxation base on the carbon impact? I won't ask you all to answer, probably just pick one or two of you. So let's just leave that for a moment. There was another... You want to chuck it yourself, sir? I think you can. At your own... That... Oh, God. Come on, you didn't even throw it. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but I promise I will throw it back. Um, no, I don't know to, to whom, but uh, to him. maybe to you. OK. Uh, so I'm Luke Hendricks. I'm, I'm from ECTA, from the telecom sector. So thank you for mentioning the, the connectivity. But that's not where I wanted to put my question. Uh, I'm wondering why hydrogen is not mentioned and is now all the focus is on electricity. Uh, and uh, also looking to that to trust, there is not a week where you don't read in the newspaper that uh, Tesla car has, has burned. Even the firefighters advise people not to charge their Tesla anymore inside. So why is that hydrogen not? playing okay. a more important role. OK. It was actually mentioned, but we can come back on that, certainly. You would like to come back on that, so perhaps I can start with you. And look, gentlemen, you need to stand up and, and take this like a... Oh! <laughs> Didn't have enough coffee, though. Okay. <laughs> OK. Yes, sir. Who are you, please? I'm Luc Bontemps. I'm a CEO... Here? Up here? Oh, yeah. And oh, Luc, yeah. That's Luc why Bontemps you have it, actually. And the, the CEO of uh, Fébiac, the Belgian Association, and president of the Liaison Committee of ASEA. Um, yes, we will have a new commission. We have a new parliament. Uh, we have already in Belgium a new government in Brussels, by the way. And the, the sad thing is that in that government declaration, no word on electromobility. And if uh, I hear there are no charging points, well, there are no charging points, and there is absolutely not a plan to have them for the coming years. And what I hear, uh, for instance, from Ecolo, is they are against e electromobility, because they are against cars. And I really tell you, and you can count them here in Brussels, uh, we need there some more, uh, I would say, drive from the Commission in order that we get uh, in the capital of Europe, please, also this electromobility done. Okay. We have a plant in Audi Brussels where they are producing 100% electric cars, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Yes, uh, hold that. Hold that thought. Hold that thought, if, if, you, if you may. If we can just come back with those. Can we start with this issue of... And ladies and gents, I cannot go over time because this fine gentleman um, is meeting the Queen of England at six o'clock. I made that up completely, Eric. So I'm going to stick to time because everybody's meeting the Queen of England, as you know, at this point. So can we start with this hydrogen? You did mention hydrogen. You wanted to talk about hydrogen uh, in answer to this question. Why is there not more talk about that and other? Yeah. So the, uh, for me, the hydrogen was hidden in my word, electrified mobility. Yeah? Uh, I can assure you that as a materials technology company, we are also very active in the development of components for fuel cell vehicles. We were recently uh, certified for a Korean uh, car maker, and uh, that was in the public, and uh, we had a press release. We start building our first major production plant for that electrocatalyst used in the fuel cell vehicle in Seoul. And so I confirm you that, uh, of course, within the tech portfolios, of course, these technologies are looked at, but clearly uh, towards, I would say, the current and absolute necessity of launching those zero emissions solutions now, we don't have still the right maturity of the whole technologies, and second, the affordability of the whole system also. So, yes, of course, it is part of our tech roadmaps, but not still at the right level of affordability, maturity, to be uh, deployed right now, now we have to deal with this energy transition. But it is part of it, of course. I'm going to jump to that last question, actually. Perhaps I will turn to you for some thoughts on that. You know, you heard there, you know, well, hey, in the city of Brussels, we've got this party, they're saying, you know, Ecolo, we just don't want cars at all. So there is a challenge there. Um, so we've got this possibility supply, we can't, there aren't the charging infrastructure. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm a bit surprised about the, the, the example because I heard that Brussels actually adopted the Amsterdam-style system where once you buy an electric, uh, electric car, you can request your commune and if you don't have a charge point within 300 meter radius, the commune will provide one for you. That was the, the latest news and I heard. 
But look, not to kind of speak of what different people say, you know, me, I say, you say, I do agree with you that rolling out charging infrastructure is a challenge. I think there's a lot that we can actually ask from the Commission to help here with member states. Uh, putting some conditions in the funding, regional funds, CEF, a lot of funding programs, just putting it to them that if you want that money, you need to prioritize that is, is one. And the, the big infrastructure law in, in, in Europe will be reviewed next year. So this is a real opportunity to, to talk about some of these problems there. So yes, there are problems, but I think there's also solutions. So let's, let's work together to, to make it happen. Can I, yes, Arthur, perhaps on that, but also on this issue that we talked about in terms of uh, taxation, the very first question that we had. Yeah. Um, I think on the last point, Julia, of course, it's nice if the Commission would have the power to just dictate what happens in the world. We don't have that. And I think everybody knows that we have tried to uh, regulate uh, that electricity and charging points move into buildings, and we lost that case in Parliament and in Council. Still, we will look very carefully in the coming weeks and months in terms of what is going to happen. And I think um, we would be ready to take some legislative moves, but these things are not done quickly. Um, I think our Finnish colleague was clearly saying it takes some time um, because we have a democratic system and it is Council and Parliament who will um, have to negotiate and decide at the end. And before you roll it out then, it it's kind of takes its time. Um, when it comes to spending money, yes, maybe we can be a bit more influential, but you also have to take into account um, Europe's budget is 1% of GDP. We talk much larger numbers. Am I not right here? Yes. Um, the value of carbon, um, yes, and that is something that is going to be looked at. Um, but it is not something that is going to provide an answer to the immediate issues that we have. I think it's the same with the whole life cycle analysis. You can go into analysis, analysis over analysis until you have it perfect, but it also spends a lot of time. I think we need to get the system right in the coming years because the cars will be coming out of the factories next year, the year thereafter, and we need to make sure that they are going to get onto the roads. I think that is the real task that is ahead of us in the near term. Um, on the hydrogen, um, we are fully with you, um, and for me as well. When I talk about electricity and electrified vehicles, um, I mean all the ones, and a hydrogen vehicle for me is also an electric vehicle. I'm going to park there because there were two hands there, and we have, you can see I'm a bit of a stickler, guys, but uh, 10 minutes barely, so we had two there. Hang on, you've got to have something thrown at you. Oh, you are. Yes. No, she's not throwing. Oh, it was placed in your hands. Who are you, sir? And hold it right up here, please. Sure, okay. John Cooper, Fuels Europe, the Association for the Liquid Fuels but fuels refining in Europe. I've got a question. I'd like a short answer from each of the panellists about what should the strategy be for the internal combustion engine. Our work has shown that we can actually make liquid fuels with a very low carbon content, with multiple different technologies. They do cost more. They're not recognised in the vehicle policy today, but you can do it. So we hear concerns about whether the pace of electrification can meet the expectations. We also see that 40% of cars out of Europe are actually exported to different markets where those support mechanisms for electric cars are not there. So my simple question is, should the car industry go all in to electrification or should it retain the very advanced, very efficient internal combustion engine expertise that it has for uses with these fuels or in export markets? Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. And the last question from, there was another I believe, gentlemen here, you can go on, throw it, go on. One, two, three. Yay, <laughs> you did it. We have to clap because he caught it. Voila, take a bow. Okay, yes, sir, please okay. hold it right up here. All right, so my name is Peter Murphy, and I'm the automotive correspondent at SP Global Market Intelligence. Uh, I wanted to ask um, about, you know, with all of the calls for the Commission to step in uh, to help with the charging infrastructure, does that should we understand through that, that that there is no private sector in incentive, that the economics of this don't add up for anyone in the private sector to get involved with this themselves? Okay. All right. Should we should we start with that one? Yeah. 
You want to come? Yeah, start, begin, thank you. Maybe I start with the last one. Um, oh, okay. On the charging infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, clearly, um, if you talk to the Commission, you'll never get 100% of the money from the Commission. Uh, we try to be clever and we always talk about leverage. So we want to get most of our public back because that's the expectation of the taxpayer. So there will have to be a private sector coming in uh, if we do a project uh, also on the infrastructure charging um, and supporting that. Um, on the internal combustion engine, um, just look at our figures. Um, if we are going to accomplish the tough targets of uh, the year 2030, you will still have 80% of the cars with an internal combustion engine. So it's not like overnight we are going to shut down, and I don't think that any of the manufacturers has plans to shut down. And at the same time, I think I was clear in the beginning, we also said we need to look at the issue of fuels uh, in the different parts of Europe, what are the opportunities, um, and also for which kinds of applications uh, this will be the best suited solution. And we know that we will need to do more in the coming years. Okay, keep it nice and short because I've got a last question for you all. So, would you like to come back yes, on just that add, question? Yes, just confirm that Europe. in fact, yes, of course, internal combustion engines are still also in our portfolios. Just because this change, major change, will not happen within one day to the other one. So that they are still within our portfolios, of course. Um, so. My point is, uh, at the end, uh, because we are talking here about Europe, but we must also consider that most of the OEMs are worldwide ones. So looking at also other regions, looking at other expectations also from the different markets, of course, we'll still have research and improvement of these ICE, uh, I would say, technologies. Uh, Max, can you come on this? There was a question there. What strategy do you have? What do you think should be the strategy? for the internal combustion engine. What about all that expertise that's there going forwards? Yeah, I, I, w I wouldn't focus on you know the, the expertise side and, and actually I'll just look at the economics of it. It would be reckless to abandon the combustion engine with current battery costs and technology. I don't think anyone's looking at it, as the other panelists uh, said. Um, you know, don't forget how economically fragile this industry is. It doesn't make much money over the cycle. Some of these companies make almost nothing over the cycle, yet it's able to produce, what is it, 14 million cars for the European consumer, uh, very uh, affordable cars, good cars uh, that work with a combustion engine. And until the uh, technology changes or the tax uh, and fiscal regime changes, it's just, it's not going to fly uh, the dramatic transition as described. Anything, what, res what, or something new, something you'd like to add to that? Yeah, well, just uh, confirming that as a materials technology company, I mentioned uh, that our investment in the fuel cell making. Uh, of course, we are uh, one of the biggest investors in uh, battery chemicals plants in the European Union, but that does not exclude that we invest heavily in technology for combustion engines. For example, the launching of the catalyzed gasoline particulate filter, mm -hmm. one of the major steps of our industry as well. So for, for us, they stay part of the portfolio that we need towards a affordable, sustainable mobility. Last, last brief from you. Thank so, you, Julia. So, to be the party pooper, uh, I, I think I would say from the climate perspective, from city perspective, from consumer perspective, we do believe that it is time in Europe to start a serious conversation about a phase-out date of internal combustion engine when it comes to cars, to light-duty vehicles. Having said that, is there space for decarbonized fuels? Yes, absolutely. But given their price, given the, the investment, the amount of electricity needed, we should be spending them in a more optimal way rather than putting them in cars where better solutions exist to decarbonize and instead using those fuels to decarbonize such difficult sectors like aviation, for example. So certainly would be interested in a dialogue there because this is where electrification is not possible. But from a pure uh, perspective of where cities should be going and, and, and cars, yes, it's fully electric, together with being shared and, and, and uh, integrated into the urban mobility. You wanted to come back on one thing. Okay, go on. Just, yeah, just, take, take, yep. Just to add something, we mustn't forget also that this zero emission mobility is not only answering cities. And I think that we absolutely need, absolutely, because you focused a lot on that, but yes, but mobility must be accessible for every of our customers. And uh, 
having only this, only I would say right city focus, of course it is a major one. But don't forget that mobility, freedom of mobility is absolutely key for everyone. And ah. so let's have this tech neutrality in order also to make us able to provide and propose the best technologies linked to the best expectations and necessities. Who, out of interest, who, who shares that view that there is often too much focus on the cities and there's not enough on, on, on if we really are to offer mobility as a service? Okay. So, I'm going to, I'm sorry I can't open things to the floor anymore, but you will thank me when you get your hands on something cold and alcoholic at six o'clock, okay? But are, these, are you here this evening, good people? You are. So there you go. You have ample time to um, grab them and have a face-to-face -face chat. Can I ask a last question before I close this panel? And the last question is what you know I'm going to ask. You know, we, we've got this new commission coming up. We've got the parliament. So we've heard of some of these challenges. OK, there is no silver bullet. It's highly complex. It's really quite an origami for the mind and for stakeholders and for the whole ecosystem. So if you can wave your magic when you have your wish, what do you want to be carried forward? What do you want to see? Where do you want to see that push in the new commission and the parliament? Thank you. Um, helping, um, I would say, enhancing affordability of those solutions. We discussed about tax, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, infrastructure, just to be a little bit provocative, but um, I think that uh, OEMs have uh, penalties if they do not reach the CO2 targets, which is absolutely key. Uh, what about uh, infrastructure, I would say, uh, policies on the state? Uh, if the roadmaps are not implemented, what, about, what are the consequences? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we could also have this kind of uh, thinking just to, to be provocative. <laughs> Thank you, Artur. I think I said it. I want these one million charging points. <laughs> and nicely distributed in Europe so that people will not have feel range anxiety. Will not have? <laughs> range anxiety. Yes, range anxiety, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes, Max. Can, can, can I give a more than 10 second answer? This, this yes. focus on charging is all very interesting, but actually if you look at the target audience that could run an electric vehicle without more charging infrastructure, it's actually quite sizable. And very few of them are buying electric cars. So I think we might be uh, looking at the wrong thing here. If you look at the number of people who have multi-car households, who are wealthy, who have off-street parking, why are we not converting more of those to EVs if EVs are so compelling? I'm not sure building charging infrastructure dramatically changes consumer behaviour. I think the focus has to be on consumer behaviour. I think Julia's point about advertising is fascinating. I think that's probably where we need to be looking. We're all looking for breakthroughs in chemistry and cost. We probably need to look for breakthroughs in advertising, and this industry is very good at that. But in the meantime, my one request would be some sort of coordinated fiscal plan to incentivize these cars. Thank you. Yes, Egbert. Yeah, so I, I, I wish the, the new commission, of course also the new uh, parliament, to continue uh, in a non-disputable way in this uh, fantastic chance of, of transition, but do that with an even higher attention to the internal coherence of all the regulatory aspects. Mm -hmm. And I can uh, fill the whole evening with examples. Go uh, on, go ahead, <laughs> go on. Let's just throw the book out. No, okay. Well, you can fill the whole evening later. So if you want to hear all about that, gather round. And thank you. Last yes. from you, Very please. briefly, so much have been said. I would say just keep the momentum and really get to the point where immobility really penetrates and is the most of sales in Europe, which means an IC phase out. Alongside that, Completely, completely there needs to be supportive policy, just transition. Uh, regions that today are really reliant on, on diesel, there's some factories and, and towns that are built around it, need to be supported. But that cannot slow down the transition. It might be just a, a short-term plaster, but long-term, this is the direction. So let's, let's, get, let's not get distracted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can I give firstly, I'm not going to sum up because I don't have the minutes, there's so much, but I hope that you will, Eric, do a little bit of that and I will do it right at the end before I release these good people. We covered so much ground. Who feels that that was an interesting dynamic conversation and they take one, at least one new thing away? Was that useful for you? Was that... Goody, okay. So there you go. You have done a very, very good job. Can you give them a very warm round of applause? Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs>